My name is Mark Sattler. I teach history here at Rockingham Community College, and I am very proud to introduce uh, Dr. Charlotte Bodig. Uh, she received her AB from University of Berkeley in Integrative Biology, and in 2000 she received her PhD from UC San Francisco in Neuroscience. 2003 to 2007, she served as a research scientist and associate investigator at the Ernest Gallo Clinic and Research Center. And from 2000 to the present, she has been teaching at University of North Carolina. She's now an assistant professor. Since 1995, she has over 25 academic uh, publications, including Immediate Reward Bias in Humans, Impulsive Responding in, Al in Alcoholics, and Impulsivity, Frontal Lobes, and Risk of Addiction. Her work now focuses on addiction, cognitive neuroscience, learning, and decision making. Please turn off your cell phones and join me in welcoming Dr. Charlotte Bonner. All right, thank you very much uh, for coming today. Um, and uh, it's nice to be an emissary from the first public university um, to the first community college in North Carolina. Um, and you may or may not know that our new chancellor at UNC is a product of the community college system herself. So um, I hope that we might see some of you come over our way uh, after you're done here. Um, so I wasn't sure about the scientific background of the group um, that I'd be talking with today. So I'm going to keep it at a level that I hope will maintain interest uh, across a different range of, um, of expertise. And please feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. Um, and um, so, first of all, um, I guess I don't need to convince at least that part of the room this is a big problem. Um, it affects an enormous number of people. Um, but to give you some numbers, um, it's the leading cause. Um, uh, uh, let's see, here are the leading causes of death in the year 2000 in the United States. Number one is tobacco, which, um, there you go, um, with 18% uh, of, um, of deaths. Um, number two, um, is poor diet and physical inactivity, which you might attribute some of that to um, addictive-like use of, um, of palatable foods. Uh, and number three, alcohol consumption. Um, use of illicit drugs actually accounts for a very small number, and this is, reflects the fact that illicit drug use is not all that common um, in the population. Um, but so uh, together, um, these um, uh, behaviors uh, lead to more deaths and disabilities than any other uh, cause. Um, so substance abuse is an enormous problem. Um, it costs a lot of money um, and uh, it causes uh, a lot of um, suffering, uh, both in the people that have these disorders and the people around them, their families, the people they work with, um, uh, people who are collateral damage in the case of people who drive um, impaired and that sort of thing, or work impaired. Um, it's the third largest risk factor um, for disease burden. So in addition to, um, for example, alcoholism is what we think of as the main negative health consequence of excessive alcohol use, um, but it also is a major risk factor for cancer, for several forms of cancer, um, and uh, it leads to uh, liver disease, all kinds of health um, consequences come from misuse of alcohol. So it has uh, an enormous effect, not just in our country, but worldwide. It's actually um, the leading risk factor for death among males age 15 to 59, um, and that may have to do with the fact that um, this is a, um, a, a demographic that tends to misuse alcohol more so than other demographics. All right, um, so what are the stages of, um, of drug use? We could stop the problem altogether, I suppose, um, if people just never used substances of abuse, right? Um, so you have to initiate use. Um, but for some substances, like alcohol in particular, which is legal um, in most places, it's commonly used by many people. Um, and yet, most people, um, they may transition into regular use, but they never transition from regular use into escalating or compulsive use. Um, and this is really where the problem um, begins. Um, and uh, from that point, people can uh, accelerate into what we characterize as addiction or drug dependence. 
And even when people are able to discontinue use, so be able to become abstinent from um, their uh, drug use, they can then uh, relapse back into um, uh, continued escalating or compulsive use. And what I want to talk to you about a little bit today is how there may be underlying biological factors that contribute to whether people progress um, down this pathway um, and whether they um, uh, continue to cycle um, through this end um, of the drug use um, cycle. And so um, that's sort of depicted here where we have genetic variables, environmental factors, um, stresses, um, learning or conditioning effects that all uh, contribute to whether um, people um, transition from social or recreational non-harmful um, substance use into um, a, a, a um, pathological use of those drugs. And what's important to note is that among people who try substances, all substances of abuse, um, the proportion of people who will transition into this escalating compulsive use, the pathological state, is quite small. It's somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of individuals, and that's true for cocaine, for heroin, for alcohol, for nicotine. Nicotine is actually the worst. You have the highest probability of transitioning to compulsive use um, if you start using nicotine. Um, but the proportion of people for all substances of abuse is relatively small, and that tells us that there's something about particular people that makes them more susceptible than others, um, given the same exposure to those substances. Um, and there's also been a, um, a great deal of genetics um, work, particularly with twins um, and, uh, and the like, which has told us that the heritable aspect of these um, disorders is in the neighborhood of 50%, somewhere between 40 and 60% heritable. Um, that means there's a large contribution, about half the contribution is environmental, but there's a large contribution from underlying biology. Um, all right, so the initial kind of ideas about what leads to um, addiction um, came a lot in large part from what we know about observations of alcohol misuse and opiate misuse. Um, and um, for those particular drugs, what we see is something called drug tolerance, and that with continuing use, you need to increase the dose of the drug in order to get the same effect um, of the drug that you did get initially. Um, and we see this um, in hospital settings, for example, when people are taking opiates for pain medication. We, uh, if we prolong the duration of that um, opiate use, you have to give people escalating higher and higher doses in order to achieve the same level of analgesia. Um, and um, this leads to a physical dependence um, because our bodies um, essentially develop uh, adaptive, counteractive responses um, to those drugs. Um, this is one of the reasons why withdrawing from alcohol is actually quite dangerous um, for people that are physically dependent upon it because uh, alcohol has a depressant effect. It activates the depressant um, neurotransmitter system in our brain, the GABA system. And in, uh, in response to that, our excitatory, our glutamate system hyperactivates to try to counteract that to keep us at a normal sort of um, uh, alertness level. And so when we take the alcohol away, all those compensatory responses are still there. And it makes um, folks who are withdrawing from alcohol at great risk of seizure um, because the overexcitation um, is what uh, can lead to seizure. Um, so these adaptive neural changes that counteract the effects of the drug um, are um, evidence of physical tolerance um, to the drugs. But it's important to know that this physical tolerance, this physical dependence, is not addiction. I can tell you a little story um, from my own personal experience. So I had a, my lung collapse, strange uh, incident that happened, and it wouldn't just heal up on its own. And so the way that that is dealt with is they go in and they literally take something like a Brillo pad and they rub it all over the external surface of your lung, make it all really inflamed. And then when, after they do that, the inflammation causes that lung surface to stick to your chest cavity. And over time, that adhesion becomes permanent. And so then your lung can no longer collapse. Um, 
so it's a great thing. And the downside of that is that since it depends on this inflammatory process, you cannot take anti-inflammatory drugs for the pain, which is intense. Um, and those anti-inflammatory drugs are potently effective. But uh, so instead, the only option that we have for us um, available are opiates. So I had to take large quantities of opiates for uh, about a month um, or so. First morphine in the hospital, and then after the hospital, um, OxyContin, I think, um, one of the um, synthetic uh, opiates. And I sure didn't like that stuff. I didn't like the way it made me feel. I felt kind of depressed and sad a lot of the time, but, um, but it did keep the pain away and I took it. And when they finally took the chest tube out of my chest cavity, sewed me up, the pain was over, I could take ibuprofen again. Um, I was so happy and I threw that bottle of opiates away and I went in to see my doctor a week later and he asked how I was feeling and I said, you know what? I kind of feel like I got the flu, like my legs are kind of achy, I feel like I've got a fever, and I, but I don't have a temperature, I don't know, I just, my nose is running, my digestive system is acting up, and I, you know, I just feel terrible, and he said, oh, you're withdrawing from opiates, and I thought, of course I am, I'm withdrawing from opiates, and it didn't even occur to me that you know, it, you know, you'd think that I would, given my scientific expertise, but that my body was physically dependent on those drugs, um, and I did not develop an addictive desire to use them. Um, so those two things can happen completely independently, and it may be one reason why um, a large number of people use opiates for pain relief in a hospital setting that never go on to develop um, any kind of habitual use um, of those drugs. All right. Um, so, um, so that theory that drug tolerance is simply the, um, the underlying cause is more or less discarded. And another sort of um, view on uh, addiction has um, developed since that time, still though um, primarily um, based on what we know from alcohol and opiate dependence. So that's um, shown here, the allostasis model. And so in the allostasis model, we try a drug first, the first time. Here's our mood plotted along this uh, axis here. And boo, we feel good. There's an A process that's positive, makes us feel good, better than, um, than our baseline state. But that's followed by an opponent B process, which is negative. Um, um, so maybe we feel great the night that we're out, but then maybe we feel a little bit bummed out the next day. Um, but then that recovers and we come back to where we were to begin with, except if we start to push together the um, frequency of our drug use so that we're using the, um, the drug day after day, repeatedly, repeatedly um, over time, and what happens is this A process starts to shrink a bit um, and the B process stays just as potent um, and we never have a chance to return back to that mood baseline. And this leads to um, what the um, George Koob, who's now the director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, what he calls the dark side, that we're no longer using these substances to try to feel awesome, we're using them just to try to feel better. Um, um, so we have this new allostatic, uh, allostatic um, point um, uh, of our uh, normal baseline that we uh, try to reach. And so the, um, there's no longer such a drive for reward as a drive to uh, reduce um, negative um, states um, that could be driving these processes. And I think that's probably true for, um, for a number of um, substances of abuse. Um, another view that I would say is probably the most popular view um, in um, behavioral neuroscience um, research is that there's this incentive salience um, sensitization. So the, the cues, the people, the place, the things associated with using particular substances, they get imbued with this importance, this salience, this motivational salience. Um, as a product of their pairing with the, um, the feelings of, uh, positive feelings of using substances. And I'll walk you through um, a, a more uh, narrative version of this. So we have our 
a college student who goes to Germany on as he's an exchange student. He's super excited, right? He wants to blend in with the culture. He's got his lederhosen and his beer stein, and he tries beer for the first time, and oh, it makes him feel great, right? It's he's having an awesome time. There are these pretty girls. Um, and he feels great. Um, there's a subjective feeling of pleasure. Um, he enjoys it. Um, and over time, there are all these stimuli in his environment that are there whenever he feels so great, when he's having these beers and, um, and enjoying himself. Um, and over time, these cues, they collide with his memories of those experiences, and they help to drive the behavior that is involved in going to get that alcohol use, consuming that alcohol, getting it, consuming it. Um, and what happens then is he leaves that context maybe and he's back in the United States and it's Oktoberfest, he hears the polka music and he smells the pretzels and he sees the beer steins and we get this trigger of the wanting um, uh, drive. He wants that um, alcohol because these cues have come to drive the motivational value um, of that action. And, and this can be totally independent of whether he actually likes beer anymore, whether it feels good to him anymore, um, whether he enjoys it. And the, there appears to be two separate circuits um, that can be independent of one another. And this can sort of explain why, um, if you've ever observed somebody with an addiction, that they don't even appear to get much enjoyment out of using the substance anymore at late stages. Um, but the drive is so powerful that they have a hard time overcoming it. Um, and so that's one of the things I find very interesting. And I'll touch on a little bit later in um, one of the animal models of, um, of addiction that I think is very interesting um, and may tell us a lot about the brain mechanisms um, of this kind of behavior. All right. Yeah, and so this can happen if he becomes too um, prone to uh, doing this. Um, and what this is alluding to is that the behavior, um, instead of being goal-directed, instead of being driven by um, the desired outcome from drinking um, or consuming the substance of abuse, instead, it's habitual. It's driven by exposure to the stimuli associated with that um, uh, substance. And we can test this sort of thing um, in animals, for example, um, with tests where um, we train them that if they um, commit a certain action, maybe it's pressing a lever or pulling a chain, they get a certain reward. In this case, maybe it's candy versus maybe it's chocolate for pressing this lever. And then we can do something that, um, that takes away the contingency between making a response and getting that reward. So that Either they're randomly getting these rewards, so what they're doing doesn't matter, or we can um, devalue one of these rewards, so we can let the mouse have um, as much chocolate pellets as it wants to eat um, until it can't eat anymore, or we can inject it with something that makes it feel sick when we give it um, one of the types of rewards. And in that case, the reward is devalued. The animal shouldn't want to, to commit the action that gets them that reward anymore, much like an alcoholic shouldn't want to drink anymore if it's going to make them pass out and lose their job and uh, kill their liver. And when an action, however, has become habitual, the animal keeps pressing. Even though the outcome is devalued, the action has become dissociated from the outcome. Um, and this is something that can happen with humans, too. Um, and we have some recent evidence in my lab that people who have a history of substance abuse in a way that's completely divorced from uh, drugs, they can develop these stimulus response habits. They can develop habitual behavior more quickly than people without that history um, can. And we think that that might be um, something that contributes um, to the problem, this tendency to um, become habitual, which is important to know is actually adaptive in many cases, right? If we can just become automatic in a lot of our actions, it frees up our cognitive resources to do things that are difficult or hard, right? I don't think about the, the way that I drive to work or the way I drive into my parking garage. I do it every day, I don't think about it, I can think about other things while I'm doing that. 
you only notice how much habitual behavior you have when something has changed. So this has probably happened to all of us when um, the power goes out. And what do you do when you walk into a room? You walk into a room and you flip the light switch on and nothing happens. You know the power is out um, and yet that's an automatic behavior that's driven by the stimulus of walking into a darkened room. Um, you automatically do that. Um, and Normally, we can override these automatic behaviors um, as uh, the situation warrants, and there may be a difficulty in doing that that may, may put people um, at risk um, for, uh, for developing these problems. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the neurobiology now. So if we're going to talk about the biology of addiction, we need to be talking about the brain and the nervous system. And so I'm going to talk about sort of basics of neurons and neuronal communication because we're going to be talking about transmitter systems. And I want to make sure we're all on the same page um, with that. So the brain is built up of two kinds of cells, neurons and glia. We won't talk much about glia. It's the Greek word for glue, which gives you some view about what their um, functional purpose is. Um, really, though, they're like the facilities and administration um, at a university, whereas the, the neurons are the students and professors or the information transfer. But all the other cells are extremely important as well, and they wouldn't... Um, these neurons wouldn't work without the glia there supporting and enabling them um, to function. Um, so this is what a typical neuron looks like. It's got a cell body here. This is where its nucleus is, where all the DNA is stored. Um, so this is where we're transcribing genes. Um, and then it has this long, thin, single process called an axon, and that's the output of the neuron. That's where it's sending its messages to other neurons. Um, and it does that at these little terminals. Um, in this neuron here, we're depicting one little nerve terminal, but um, in truth, there may be a branching um, with a lot of terminals, allowing it to contact a uh, number of different cells. And then there are dendrites. Um, it's, it means um, tree-like, uh, so they have these tree-like structures. And these are the input side, so this cell would be receiving um, hundreds of thousands of inputs um, on these um, branches of its dendrites, input from other neurons. There are billions of neurons in your brain, so the, the complexity of the circuitry is, um, is really awesome. Uh, and the new brain initiative that the um, United States has launched is designed to try and figure out what's the wiring diagram of the human brain. Um, and I, I can tell you all I'm doubtful that we'll have that before I die, but um, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm pessimistic. <coughs> um, so um, how do they communicate with one another? We're going to walk through a kind of uh, cartoon diagram of how they um, communicate. So here's a neuron again, the cell body with its dendrites and its axon. And they communicate with each other at what, um, what are called synapses. So here's the um, axon terminal of neuron one, and it's contacting um, the dendrites of neuron two. Um, and it communicates using a chemical called a neurotransmitter. These are typically very small um, chemicals um, that uh, are shown here by just a little circle, but they're really a little bit more complicated than that, but small, um, small molecules. Um, and so this neuron has received a neurotransmitter um, signal, which has excited it, and now it's sending an electrical impulse down its axon, and that is going to trigger release of neurotransmitter at its own nerve terminals um, that are going to be transmitted to neuron number two. Um, and we can think of this system as sort of um, a language, and there are several different languages that are spoken um, in the brain, and that's um, the... Um, it's, we can distinguish them from one another by the particular neurotransmitter that's being used. And so a given neuron that's using a particular neurotransmitter can only be understood by neurons that have receptors for those particular neurotransmitters. Um, so that's one of the key organizational um, uh, aspects um, of the nervous system. Um, so um, this uh, continues on and on in a very complex way with all the different uh, neurons um, in the brain. Um, and this, um, I want to zoom in on how this is happening um, at the nerve terminal. And why I'm focusing on this is because this is where drugs of abuse are acting. These substances that we become addicted to are acting here um, at the synapse where neurons are communicating with one another. 
Um, so we've zoomed in. This is the axon terminal now where an electrical impulse is coming in. This is our dendrite of another neuron. And what we've got here are neurotransmitters packed up in these little vesicles um, inside the nerve terminal. And we've got receptors um, here on the, um, on the postsynaptic neuron. Electrical activity is going to come down the axon, and that's going to cause this neurotransmitter to be released um, into the synapse. It's free now. It's outside of a cell, and its job is to get across this space and bind to these receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, um, which will then trigger electrical activity in that target cell. That's the whole process. Um, that's how pretty much every neuron um, works. Um, but nature doesn't want to waste. Right? We went to all the trouble to make these neurotransmitters, and we don't want to waste them. So typically what we do um, is we take it back up. So we have these special proteins on the presynaptic terminal um, that are called transporter proteins, and they take that neurotransmitter and they recycle it. Um, they pull it back into the cell, and they pack it back up um, into vesicles so it can be used over and over again. Um, and these particular proteins, these transporter proteins, are important targets for several drugs of abuse. They're also important targets for therapeutic drugs, right? So we've probably all heard of Prozac. Um, that's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And what it does is it blocks these transporters, the ones that take serotonin back up into the brain. Um, a number of different transporter blockers have therapeutic use. Um, but um, here, now we're, uh, we're ready to go and respond to the next um, signal. Um, and I want to mention a couple of the neurotransmitter systems, the languages that are spoken um, by neurons in the brain. Um, and I'm going to start first with dopamine because we're going to talk about dopamine the most. Um, as far as we know, dopamine seems to be the most critical transmitter system for addictive behaviors. It's also very important for motivated behaviors in general. And what looks like happens in addiction is that um, our brain essentially learns to use that motivated behavior system to get drugs. Um, we, we train our brain through use of these drugs that that drug is so important. It is an important goal for us. Um, and, um, we use systems that are normally designed to get food, to get mates, to get uh, water, to get whatever survival needs um, we have. Those systems help us do. Um, and they uh, essentially get co-opted. These dopaminergic motivation systems get co-opted to, um, to get what our brain has been fooled into thinking um, is very important, um, uh, which is the, the drugs of abuse. Serotonin is another uh, language, another transmitter system. Norepinephrine, another important one. Glutamate, this is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in our brain. Um, so it's the um, one that does almost all of the signaling. Um, these are sort of modulatory systems that help uh, um, change the way our circuits are organized. Um, and GABA, which is our, um, our primary inhibitory or suppressant um, uh, transmitter system in the brain. Um, acetylcholine, which is the one acting on our muscles, um, uh, helps to um, execute all of our skeletal muscle um, function, but also has some actions in the brain um, as well. Um, adenosine, um, which um, probably most of you were modulating your adenosine system this morning, if you're like me. I had two cups that modulated my adenosine system, uh, helps keep you alert. Um, and then finally, there are um, uh, endogenous opioids. Um, so these are the um, substances produced by our own body to create analgesia um, and uh, help us um, engage in behaviors that are recuperative if we're injured. Um, and the receptors for these um, substances are the ones that um, the opiates that we abuse um, are targeting. All right, so how do drugs interfere with neuron communication? I'm going to talk um, mainly about cocaine um, in some senses because it's, um, it's very clean um, in what it does uh, pharmacologically. Um, so we've got our synapse again with our presynaptic neuron, our postsynaptic neuron, our transmitters, our receptors, our transporters. And the electrical activity has happened, neurotransmitters being released, it's binding to receptors, everything's happening normally. Oh, 
but now we've taken in some cocaine, which has an important property that contributes to the euphoriant effects um, of cocaine, which is that it can get right in, right across our blood-brain barrier, right into our brain extremely quickly, um, especially if it's smoked um, or snorted. It gets past all of our barriers into our brain extremely quickly. Um, and there's recent data showing that as people um, uh, take in cocaine and we measure the concentration of cocaine in their brain, it maps on perfectly with their self-reported high. Um, and it's the rapidity, like the tidal wave that crashes in our brain all at once that make it um, uh, such a potent um, reinforcing drug. Whereas other drugs that bind to the exact same place, so drugs like Ritalin, which is used therapeutically to treat ADHD, binds to the same receptors, but it does so in a way that's just slow and gentle, and it stays and it comes off. The, the timing is completely different, even though um, the pharmacological action is essentially the same. And we think that that has to do with why people don't abuse Ritalin in the same way um, that they abuse cocaine. So here's cocaine, um, and what it's going to come in and do is block these reuptake transporters. And so what happens then is this transmitter that was slated to be taken back up and reused instead hangs out um, where it can keep interacting with the postsynaptic neuron and keep uh, sending excitatory signals. Um, and so in a sense, this target cell is, uh, is hearing imaginary things. This cell is no longer sending any messages, but this um, target cell is still getting uh, a message um, that something is happening. Um, and that's, that's really it. Um, and um, there are a lot of other drugs that block transporters, as I mentioned. So there are a number of different antidepressants, some that block the serotonin transporter, some that block the norepinephrine transporter, or dopamine transporters. These are some of the newer um, forms um, of antidepressants. Um, drugs that treat ADHD also um, block the neuro, uh, uh, the um, transporters. Um, they're both dopamine and norepinephrine are targets um, for, um, for treating ADHD. And um, so there's important therapeutic use um, of, uh, of drugs that act like cocaine, but um, there are uh, other um, aspects uh, of its use that, uh, for some reason, probably a lot having to do with the kinetics of it that um, make it um, highly reinforcing, whereas these drugs um, are not. Um, there are also drugs that reverse transporters um, that are abused. So instead of um, blocking that transporter, instead we cause it to change its function and just dump all the neurotransmitter out um, into the synaptic cleft here. Um, and drugs that do this are amphetamines and methamphetamine, um, ecstasy. Um, it has the distinction of only acting at serotonin um, neurons, whereas these are pretty unselective, all the monoamine systems. Um, it just causes it to dump uh, the um, contents into the nerve terminal um, until they are completely empty. Um, and this actually um, has um, a high level of toxicity. So the, um, when this exchange takes place, there isn't simply a, um, a moving of a transporter molecule. There's a, an exchange of a transporter molecule for a hydrogen ion. And as you increase the level of hydrogen um, ions, the acidity um, in a cell goes up. And so um, the acidity in the nerve terminal can get so high that the nerve terminal degenerates. Um, and that can eventually lead to degeneration of that cell. Um, we actually, um, as scientists, we can buy MDMA from the pharmaceutical companies for use um, in the lab. We can give it to a, an experimental animal to selectively kill all of its serotonin neurons, um, which um, I think suggests that one should proceed with caution with any kind of um, uh, recreational use um, of these sorts of drugs. Um, and it's one way in which um, Methamphetamine and amphetamines are really quite dangerous um, and potentially um, contribute to organic damage to the brain that we really can't recover from um, and are one of the reasons that um, these are such terrible um, uh, scourges. <clears throat>
Drugs can also bind uh, to receptors. So instead of um, messing around with the um, actual release from the cells, they can just pretend to be um, neurotransmitters. So they're, we call these agonists. They bind to the receptors and trigger effects um, that um, aren't really there. Um, so this is true of um, opiates like morphine, heroin, codeine. Um, these bind to receptors and uh, act like um, our endogenous uh, neurotransmitters. Nicotine um, does this at acetylcholine receptors uh, in the brain. Um, LSD and mescaline bind to specific serotonin receptors um, acting as um, uh, agonists. Um, alcohol and Valium have agonist effects on the GABA receptors. This is why these are relaxing, sedating, uh, reduce anxiety, um, because that's what GABA is typically doing um, in our brain. And we can trick our brain um, into um, feeling that way with these um, drugs. Um, marijuana binds to um, a specific class of cannabinoid receptors don't understand the cannabinoid system particularly well. It was identified in the 90s, um, and um, it's clear that there are analgesic um, effects of the cannabinoid system. It's thought that in some animals it play, may play a role in hibernation um, behaviors, um, but uh, it's probably one of the less well understood transmitter systems uh, at this point in time. All right, um, so we can also block receptors. So um, instead of mimicking the receptor system, we can make the target cell deaf to these signals that are being sent um, by the, um, the transmitter. Um, so adenosine, um, for example, is a, um, uh, we can block that with caffeine. We can block adenosine receptors with caffeine. Um, we can block dopamine receptors with antipsychotic drugs. So drugs that we use to treat schizophrenia are, are blocking the ability of dopamine to trigger um, signals. Um, it only helps with the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, so the hallucinations and um, sort of active processes in the brain. Um, we can quell um, by blocking um, dopamine signaling. For opiate receptors, we can block the, um, uh, those receptors with naltrexone, which um, you guys may know about the use of that um, in the um, uh, emergency room. So um, there's an injectable analog called um, naloxone, and when we give that to someone who's overdosed on opiates, whew, we can knock all those opiates off their receptors um, here, um, and they are able to recover um, their respiratory function. Sure. Um, I'm just wondering, like, what exactly? Because um, there's a difference between giving um, giving naloxone rapidly or mm -hmm. slowly, mm -hmm. and I think it's interesting that if you give it rapidly and you break that up, a lot of the side effects is immediate anger, uh -huh. like, and they start fighting you. And I'm just, I've always been curious exactly what is going on with them when that. Well, we know, so if I give someone oral naltrexone, which has a much slower um, time to take effect than um, the injectable form, um, it essentially precipitates immediate withdrawal. It's like you, it's like they would feel 12 hours from now when their opiates have worn off. Um, they would start to experience withdrawal symptoms. They feel like they have the flu, they hurt, um, their digestive system isn't functioning, their n nose is running. Um, they feel physically hurt um, the same way you might feel when you have the flu, this sort of achy um, feeling, and dysphoric, so feeling bad, in a bad mood state. Um, and my guess is that if you make that come on <laughs> in a matter of, um, a minute uh, or uh, a few minutes that that may feel really awful and you may hold it against the person who's done that to you um, is the only guess that I can make. It's uh, given, especially I mean, if it's, I mean, give it rapidly if they're in like some time, if they're in like severe respiratory distress, right. Right. like for example, if they're overdosing cocaine, you know, one of the side effects is respiratory failure. So mm -hmm. if they're in respiratory arrest or if they're having uh, agonal respiration, so to speak, you know, they know that's the cause of it. A lot of times they give it rapidly, even mm -hmm. though it has that 
side right. effect, but right. it'll correct their breathing. Right. But also you get um you get some like you mentioned nausea, vomiting, and even anger. Right. Afterwards, because you just took away their their high. Right. Immediately. You you put them immediately into withdrawal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we can also, um, some drugs that are abused are also acting on our main um, signaling systems, on the glutamate system um, in the brain, and this actually produces a dissociative state um, that people um, are not, the, wor the world that they're inhabiting is not the world that they're actually in. Um, uh, it's a very strange sort of state, and they don't remember things um, as well. It blocks the ability to remember um, your experiences. So we've been talking about um, uh, the, what's going on at the synapse level, um, and I've alluded to the fact that dopamine is really driving um, motivated behaviors, um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the circuitry, um, as we understand it, of reinforcement. So reinforcement is when we do something, and the outcome of doing that is positive. We like the outcome um, that happens as a consequence of that, and so um, when that happens, we're more apt to do that same thing again. Um, and so in m most ways, this is really adaptive, right? Eating food when we're hungry makes us feel good, and so we continue to eat, and that helps keep us alive. Um, if we take away the dopamine neurons from uh, little transgenic mice, they'll starve to death. They still like food, they still think it tastes good, um, as far as we can tell, but uh, they have no drive, no motivation um, to get the food. So someone has to squirt it into their mouth for them. Um, uh, so we need this drive to um, engage in, um, in behaviors that have positive outcomes. It helps us um, navigate the world and, um, and get what we need. Um, and the neurons that allow us to do this are down here in our brainstem. Uh, and they project in a place called the ventral tegmental area. They project up to our prefrontal cortex in the front, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, um, and to a place in the, um, the more interior part of our brain called the nucleus accumbens. Um, we have another separate population of dopamine neurons in our brainstem um, called the substantia nigra, another um, adjacent place. Um, but they project up to um, what's known as the dorsal striatum, it's above the nucleus accumbens. Um, and these are the neurons that are lost in people who have Parkinson's disease. Um, so this controls voluntary um, movements. Um, so when we lose these cells, people have a very difficult time initiating voluntary movements um, as a consequence of losing these. Um, curiously, these dopamine neurons from the VTA are relatively spared early in Parkinson's disease. So this is why um, oftentimes we give people drugs that increase dopamine signaling, which that's the sort of primary um, uh, therapeutic um, approach to treating Parkinson's. And while it helps in this pathway that's been um, severely um, depleted, uh, it often overdoses this system that helps drive our motivated behaviors. And people develop compulsive behaviors, gambling, sexual compulsion, um, uh, sometimes even addictive use of their medication. Um, and we think that that um, is uh, in part because we're um, messing around with this motivated behavior system in much the same way that we do when we consume drugs of abuse. Um, all right, so the prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens I'm going to talk about um, a little bit more. Um, we came to know about the importance of the nucleus accumbens in, um, and the dopamine projection in some studies that were done way back in the 50s um, at Caltech, um, where we put um, an electrode into the brain of a little rat, um, and they tried a lot of different areas, but they wanted to see, was there an area of the brain that a rat would press a lever to stimulate? Um, and it turns out they did. Um, we call this intracranial self-stimulation. And that area that the um, rats pressed was here. They pressed for stimulating those dopamine neurons that are projecting up into the brain. Um, and they'll press and press and press. Um, and when we look in the nucleus accumbens, this target um, of these dopamine neurons, we see here's the dopamine level before. Um, and then here is what happens to the dopamine level. It goes up four times um, as, we, um, as the animal is pressing the lever and stimulating um, those dopamine projections. So we're dumping a ton of dopamine here in the nucleus accumbens. 
And if we turn it off, we see that it tends to drop back down. And if we turn it on again, we see, um, again, this huge um, increase in dopamine uh, in the nucleus accumbens. Um, and um, later um, studies, um, starting in the 1980s, were able to put probes into the nucleus accumbens and measure the chemical composition of what was there um, using um, something called microdialysis. So essentially, we take the fluid that's there and we assess what the chemical content of it is. And what we saw is that um, we take a rat, we put him into a box, the box is empty, and then we give him food. Food is available here and he's eating. Um, and we're recording the um, concentration of dopamine um, in the nucleus accumbens. And you can see that here's what um, things, uh, the, the dopamine state when the rat was just sitting in an empty box. And here's when food became available, whoo, there's a big increase um, in dopamine that gradually dissipates. Um, note that this increase is only an increase of about 50%, not a 400% increase that we saw with the direct stimulation. Likewise, another natural reinforcer, um, sex. So we put a female um, into the, um, the rat's cage, and you can see he engages in reproductive behavior with the female while she's present. Um, and there's, again, a big rise um, in dopamine levels in the nucleus accumbens. So it falls off a bit, um, um, as does his motivation to engage in reproduction. Um, <clears throat> what about drugs of abuse? Well, it turns out that they also cause uh, a large increase in dopamine levels in the nucleus accumbens. So here's amphetamine, um, which has probably the, um, the fastest and largest rise uh, in dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. See, we're up here at 1,000. So there's 10 times as much dopamine available there, um, which gradually um, declines uh, over time. Cocaine has slightly different kinetics. It's a little bit slower um, than um, amphetamine uh, and doesn't rise quite as high. Uh, but you can see that um, there's also um, a large peak that takes a long time to, to dissipate. Nicotine also causes um, a bit of a rise in um, uh, dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. Morphine also causes a rise, although the kinetics of this are quite different. Um, we think that this may, these, the kinetics of these um, rises may have something to do with the pattern that, of use that people engage in. So people will tend to take uh, a dose of opiate and then they don't need another dose until um, quite maybe the next day or maybe um, quite later in the day. Um, whereas people using stimulants will tend to use stimulants over and over at short um, intervals. Um, of time. And here we're um, also seeing the dose response curve. So as the dose of, um, of morphine increases, this level of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens goes up. And so this, these uh, series of studies sparked tremendous interest in dopamine as the key molecule for addiction. Um, and there was a lot of um, early ideas based on this microdialysis data that um, essentially, dopamine was the feel-good, rewarding, euphoriant molecule. Um, and it turns out that that's probably not accurate, um, that it's really the motivational signal. Um, and it comes to be triggered by cues associated um, with, uh, with reward. So the initial experience um, of a reward is associated with dopamine release, but after that, um, that reward no longer causes dopamine release and instead cues that are associated or predict that reward come to um, elicit dopamine release. Um, and we couldn't tell that from these experiments because the time scale was too, too slow. Um, and newer methods that have allowed us to look at very fast time scales have helped to clarify that dopamine appears to be a motivational signal um, and not so much a, a euphoria or reward um, signal. All right, so dopamine is important. Dopamine in the striatum uh, is especially important. This led to some work um, in the early 90s um, by a woman named Nora Volko, who's now um, the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. She wanted to see what did the dopamine system look like in people who had a cocaine addiction relative to healthy control people. And she used a, a method called PET, positron emission tomography, where we're able to 
put a radioactive label onto a chemical that binds to the dopamine receptors. So it's a ligand for those dopamine receptors, um, but it has a radioactive tag on it that we can detect with our PET camera, um, that, which detects the radioactive signal. And what we're seeing up here in the top row are four different slices um, from most uh, dorsal to most uh, ventral. Um, and the color indicates the, um, the density of dopamine receptors um, that are there, where blue is the lowest um, and red is the highest. And so you can see um, this is the striatum area. This is where most of the dopamine receptors are uh, in the brain. Um, and we can see that there's very dense um, staining, um, so, or very dense signal um, of uh, dopamine receptors there in the normal healthy control brain. And in an age and education matched cocaine abuser who's been in an inpatient treatment program for one month, um, you can see that uh, looking at those same levels of the brain um, for this individual, there's a dramatically reduced um, level of dopamine receptors um, in the brain. Of course, we don't know, is this just a consequence of using cocaine for a long period of time, or is it something that was a pre-existing uh, trait? Um, we see that it does recover a bit. So here's um, uh, this person at four months, so three months after this initial um, time, you can see that there's a little bit of recovery of the dopamine receptors, but still um, profoundly reduced relative to the control subject. Um, and this has led to a lot of investigation, since we've seen that abnormalities in dopamine signaling are associated with all the drugs of abuse we've had a look at. Um, it's led to um, studies to try to figure out whether um, this is a, a commonality. Um, and I'll get to that in a few slides from now. Um, but I'm also going to show you that um, this led us to um, some new avenues of research that we could do in animal models where we can get a little bit more invasive and we can ask the chicken or egg question because we can examine um, individuals before their experience of chronic um, drug self-administration. All right, so um, this is some work that was done at Wake Forest University um, where they have um, colonies of monkeys. Monkeys have a very hierarchical society. They um, uh, arrange themselves in order from dominant um, to submissive. The dominant ones pick on the others and the submissive ones get picked on um, by the others. And what they found is that if um, they tested the um, tendency of these animals to self-administer cocaine that these subordinate monkeys, the guys on the bottom of the, um, the hierarchy, were more apt to um, acquire cocaine self-administration. They took more of it. They appeared to find it more reinforcing than the dominant monkeys did. And these monkeys, before they were put into this cocaine self-administration paradigm, they were... Um, they took PET scans um, of their dopamine receptors. Um, and what we see is that the subordinate monkeys had extremely reduced dopamine receptors in the striatum, just like we saw in the cocaine addicts. Um, and the dominant monkeys had bright uh, signal um, of dopamine receptors. And, and they were more resistant um, to the, uh, the reinforcing properties um, of cocaine. We also see the same thing in rats. So um, a group of um, scientists in England uh, divided rats up into impulsive animals versus less impulsive animals. So here the impulsive guys are shown in the filled circles and the um, non-impulsive or less impulsive animals are in the, um, the empty circles. And here we're showing premature responses and a little task. So the rat is supposed to wait, 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 wait until a cue comes on and he puts his nose in a particular port. Um, and some of them can't wait. They can't wait for the light to come on, and they just go stick their nose in a port when they're not supposed to. Um, and these are the number of, uh, or the percent of premature responses that they make. Um, and here on this day, they extended the amount of time the rats had to wait, and you can see everybody became more impulsive then, but um, these guys were still markedly above um, the others. And if we give these guys um, a chance to self-administer cocaine, those impulsive guys develop um, a, uh, more um, compulsive, higher rate um, of cocaine intake than the non-impulsive rats do. And the dopamine levels in the striatum of, um, of these impulsive rats is lower 
relative to um, the non-impulsive rats. Um, and again, these um, PET images were taken um, before any cocaine exposure, suggesting that low levels of dopamine um, receptors in your striatum may be a risk factor um, for um, acquiring um, compulsive use of stimulants, um, at least. Um, and it's not only true for cocaine um, in humans, as I was alluding to a few slides back. So we see this deficit in dopamine receptors in the brain um, in cocaine addicts, in methamphetamine addicts, um, in alcoholics, in heroin addicts. Um, it, that, this seems to be one of the factors that's shared across these quite different substances um, of abuse. Um, and more recently, there's even data showing that people who um, are obese have reduced levels of dopamine receptor binding in the striatum relative to normal weight um, uh, folks. Um, and so there's increasing interest in the idea that um, certain forms of uh, obesity may be akin to um, uh, addictive um, intake um, of particularly palatable foods, sweet foods, fatty foods, um, things like that. <laughs> um, what about other factors um, that we, uh, we know of that seem to um, be biological um, factors that put people at risk? Um, so again, this is data for um, in the realm of stimulants, um, but it looks to be that um, individuals who are more sensitive to a stressful situation are also more prone to self-administer um, drugs like um, amphetamine and cocaine. So here we can measure um, how active rats are when we put them into a novel situation. So um, it's a little bit scary for a rat to be put in a little chamber it's never been in before. And what they do is they run around, freak out. Um, and we have ones that uh, they run around a fair amount in a two hour period, but um, we have others that run around twice as much. They are way more freaked out by being in this novel situation. We call those high responders um, and low responders. And if we take these two groups and give them a chance to self-administer amphetamine or cocaine, um, these high responders are much more apt to um, self-administer cocaine um, or amphetamine. Than, um, than the low responders are. And this appears to um, be something that is biological, but it may not be inherited. So we know if we take their adrenal glands away, the, uh, the glands that are uh, releasing the stress chemicals, stress hormones, um, we can eliminate this effect. Um, and if we inject these low responding animals with stress hormones, we can make them like the high responders. So it's a biological um, factor, but it's not something um, that's uh, inherited uh, necessarily. So this may be an epigenetic biological um, risk factor. How would you explain those, those first two days? It seems like the low responders actually respond more positively. And then there's a very dramatic drop off where you have the inverse reaction on the other. That's a good question. They may, um, oops, sorry. Um, they may um, need a bit of experience with it. Um, so they don't get the, um, they get limited access um, on each day um, to experience what it feels like. There may be some adaptations that go on um, in their brain over time. Um, and these guys, it seems to be a little bit variable probably um, in terms of when this transition happens. Um, so there's a lot of variance in that first uh, day. But these guys um, seem to, after a little bit of experimenting with it, decide that it, they have no interest in that feeling. <clears throat> and this is probably one of my, my favorite um, animal models um, of, um, of drug addiction that I hope that there will be a lot more research um, uh, to investigate. Um, and here's the experiment. So rats uh, are brought in and they're given a chance to um, self-administer cocaine um, and they either um, have very extensive um, experiences with cocaine that far um, exceed these few days that we see here, um, or they have very moderate exposure. So they've just started um, and reached um, stable self-administration um, zones here. And so we've got three groups, um, essentially the extended cocaine group, um, which is going to show differences um, after this manipulation here, and the moderate um, cocaine group. And so what happens is that 
the rats are going along every day. They get to come into the cage, press the bar, get some cocaine. They feel great. You know, it's much better than sitting in their boring cage doing nothing, which is what their life is normally like. And then suddenly, after this time point, they come in again, and instead of getting cocaine every time they press the bar, 50% of the time, <coughs> they get an electric shock. <coughs> electric shock. Negative consequence, right? The kind of thing that should devalue that cocaine. And what happens is the moderate cocaine rats stop pressing the lever for the most part, and they don't want to risk um, that uh, electric shock anymore. Um, to, um, they don't want to press that lever and risk that shock, even though they're giving up the chance um, to get the cocaine. Um, but and h half, um, more than half of the um, extended use guys also quit using. But a goodly proportion, about 18, 17% of the rats who um, are getting the electric shock say, hmm, I don't care. Um, and they go back to pressing that lever just as often as they ever did. Um, so these guys are resistant to punishment, to negative consequences, to devaluation of that substance. Um, and that's really similar to the percentage of people who try drugs and develop addictions. Um, and I think that we don't really understand yet what the biological basis of this is. Um, and I think it will be really important for us to, um, to try to understand that. Um, is it insensitivity to punishment generally? Um, is it uh, difficulty in pairing uh, negative consequences with actions? Is it a hyper ability to form habitual actions? Um, we don't know. Those are three sort of possibilities um, that, uh, that might contribute. Um, um, but it also tells us that individuals um, have these underlying differences that um, the same circumstances will lead to quite different outcomes for them. And, and I think this is uh, important for people to know um, in that it, people's behavior um, doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily the only contributor towards um, their substance abuse problems. Um, and uh, that's my evangelical um, thing that I want to get out. Um, so. Alcoholism and other substance abuse is really um, underserved as a public health problem. Um, if we compare it, say, to schizophrenia, which is about tenfold less common, um, back in 2005, which is almost 10 years ago now, there were 20 approved medications. And I specifically do not update this slide because there's still nothing more um, for uh, substances um, of abuse. So we have a total of six medications for helping people um, stay sober, or stay clean um, of opiates um, and alcohol. Some of these are shared drugs, um, which is why there's, this doesn't add up to eight. Um, we currently still have nothing um, available to treat stimulant addiction, um, not, not a thing. Um, we've tried a lot of different things. Um, and I think one of the problems for why we haven't been able to find something is that most of the research to date has been based on animal models of addiction. Uh, we call this a bottom-up approach, where we put a rat in a cage and we give them some kind of medication and say, does it make them stop pressing the bar for cocaine? Maybe it does, but a, a variety of reasons could underlie why they no longer want to press that bar from co for cocaine. And many of those reasons might make something a terrible therapeutic for people. Um, and so I think that um, we need to have um, a, a complementary approach um, to trying to solve um, addiction. Um, and in particular, I think we need to take a top-down approach in studying people um, because of this green, this green part right here. So this is a human brain. And this green zone right here is the prefrontal cortex. And you can see that our closest relative, the chimpanzee, has a reasonably large um, prefrontal cortex. The rat, which is our primary um, model that's used um, in animal research, it, uh, it has a, just the tiniest little sliver of something that we call prefrontal cortex. Um, even a cat, which seems like a complex animal, has very little. Um, and the prefrontal cortex, what does it do? Um, number one, it's a key target of drugs of abuse. It's one of the areas that gets a dopamine projection from the VTA. 
Um, it's also what is known as the seat of executive control. So if we damage the prefrontal cortex, we lose control over our behavior. And essentially, addiction is a loss of control, right? Um, it's an inability to not take that drink, to not stick that needle in your arm when you know it's a bad idea. You know that the consequences of it are going to be bad. Um, and that says to me, just on its face, that the prefrontal cortex must not be working properly um, in folks with those um, conditions. It's the most developed in humans, so we really need to study it um, in humans. Um, it's also the part of the brain that uh, develops latest. So here, purple indicates um, latest on the, uh, the, um, the lifespan um, of development. And this is the frontal lobe again. And much of the frontal lobe is not fully developed until um, the early 20s. It varies from individual to individual, as we all probably have had experience. Um, but um, it's quite late. Um, it occurs a little bit earlier in females than males, which may be one reason why um, females are a little bit less apt uh, to do things that are um, ill-advised uh, when they're in their teenage um, and early 20s. Um, what, what, what are the things that it does? Problem solving, executive control, decision making, inhibition, uh, planning, um, associations between things. Um, so we know um, all of these, um, uh, we can, we're able to assi assign all of these functions to the frontal lobe based on lesion studies. So people get strokes in their frontal lobe um, relatively commonly, and so we're able to um, identify what kinds of deficits, specific deficits do people have. People are still perfectly intelligent. You can take away their frontal lobe and they can still do math, they can still read, they can do all kinds of complicated things. Um, and in fact, when we do um, uh, MRI studies, maybe we're doing an experiment um, uh, testing um, the neural mechanisms of some particular function or other, um, sometimes we find anomalies in people's brains. And we're most likely to find anomalies in people's brains in the frontal lobe because they kind of go undetected. It's not like you lose your ability to see or you have some kind of motor impairment. It might just make you a little weird or make you um, uh, do things that uh, are a little bit ill-advised. But uh, these things can somewhat go uh, unnoticed and fall into the realm of what makes uh, people unusual um, relative to others. Uh, <clears throat> and the sort of going idea for what's happening in the addicted brain um, now, based on uh, a lot of the stuff I've talked to you about so far, is that in the normal brain, uh, stimuli in our environment, um, the salience of those stimuli is detected, it's compared against our memory of, um, of those um, uh, stimuli, um, our control systems are engaged, our drive systems um, are put into check, um, and we withhold a lot of actions that we might have um, some impulse to um, engage in, uh, but we don't, right? We have a paper due tomorrow, so we're not gonna go out drinking with our friends tonight, um, thanks to our frontal lobe. Um, but in the addicted brain, there's been some deficits um, in executive function, so this control system isn't very effective, and it has an inability to suppress um, the drive system, and the salience and drive systems become highly, highly upregulated um, and powerful, um, and this drive to, um, to do things um, on impulse or compulsively um, becomes very um, uh, difficult to control. Uh, and so one of the um, areas, and I'll probably try to wrap it up here, is that um, I'm interested in trying to identify um, the particular subdomains of executive function that have gone awry in people with substance use disorders and may in fact have been slightly dysfunctional to begin with. Um, it could be something that has led people into these um, disorders um, and, uh, and made them vulnerable. And um, what we refer to these um, sort of uh, executive subdomains as is intermediate phenotypes. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why we've been um, so uh, unsuccessful at developing treatments um, for these disorders is, you know, you have our underlying genetics that lead to um, the uh, structure of our brain, the function of our brain. And people with substance use disorders, they really are, are not one size fits all. They come in all kinds of flavors. Um, uh, there are some people who are highly impulsive and other people who are not. 
There are some people who are highly anxious, other people who are not. There are some people who are highly stress responsive, other people who are not. Um, and when we do genetic studies, we lump them all together. The phenotype is, are you an alcoholic? Well, maybe, but the reasons why you drink alcohol compulsively may be quite disti distinct across different individuals. Um, and so um, if we can divide, subdivide this large complex syndrome into um, uh, intermediate um, subpopulations, we can then start to drill down into the biology underlying those particular um, intermediate phenotypes. And I think that will get us at the biology um, um, of addiction in, in a much um, clearer way. So we do this, um, uh, for example, in trying to identify um, the uh, brain uh, circuit functions that change um, with uh, therapeutic response. Uh, for the, so for example, um, we did a study of alcoholics taking naltrexone. It's one of the approved treatments for alcoholism, but we don't know how it works. Um, and so uh, one thing we were able to identify is that uh, for people who responded um, to naltrexone, um, there's a change in brain activity um, in a particular part of their frontal lobe that was associated with um, how they responded to alcohol cues in their environment. Um, and so we think this may be a very important because A, we think that um, automatic responses to alcohol cues in the environment may be something that perpetuates alcohol abuse um, for some individuals and that drugs that are able to, or medications that are able to suppress that automatic response um, may be um, effective new tools. And so it gives us um, essentially a new um, uh, procedure for testing um, promising substances um, in, um, in individuals. Um, and we can also um, uh, start to identify the neural mechanisms of, um, of particular sorts of behaviors, of executive behaviors. So, um, and we can do this both in people who are affected by substance use disorders in their relatives and in unaffected people. How do these executive processes work normally and how can they be modulated by neurotransmitter systems? Um, and what's the underlying genetic basis um, of these um, behaviors? And it might uh, give us a window into risk factors. Um, so uh, we can look at the behavioral phenotypes of um, individuals, for example, coming into college where is a high risk um, setting for alcohol abuse and say, I know this person is gonna be at higher risk based on these intermediate phenotype characteristics. Um, what kind of intervention might we do? Maybe education will be sufficient, but maybe some kind of intervention might be called for for those individuals that wouldn't work in somebody else. Um, so this kind of approach um, we think may help people um, may help us be more targeted in our treatment and in that way more effective. Um, we don't think there's going to be a silver bullet that will fix everybody, um, that there may be um, particular types of therapies that will be more effective um, in some folks than in others. That's right. Um, so I think I'm going to end there. Do you have any questions, please? And I got <laughs> All right. All right. Um, I was fascinated with the, the model that you had with the punishment model. Mm -hmm. Have there been, has that punishment been moved closer and further away from immediate usage and, and what kind of differences are you seeing there? Um, so in terms of, um, you mean for, for addicts or? Was that? What, what, those were rats. Okay. Mm -hmm. But was that? It was immediate, right? So when they pressed the, um, the bar to self-administer the cocaine. Instead, they got an electric shock. So they're given several days mm -hmm. ahead of that. Has that punishment been moved closer or further away from the initial term of use? Ah, right. Um, I don't think so, actually. I don't think so. The people who approve animal research don't really like it when you do these kind of paradigms. They yeah, don't and, then and do suffering in the That kind of leads to my second one, mm -hmm. is if this is that kind of model, uh, you're advocating more of a top-down approach, mm -hmm. which I assume would, would involve much more human trials. Mm -hmm. That's right. I imagine you're running into significant ethical blowback with that. Well, um, one of the things that we think is that 
these circuits that are engaged um, in um, changing our behavior flexibly after devaluation of certain kinds of actions. Um, we think that we may be able to intervene um, with those circuits um, and that the same circuits that are used generally in our life are also being used uh, in the drug use setting and that we may be able to modulate those circuits um, perhaps with things like transcranial um, stimulation or um, either electrical or magnetic stimulation of the brain. We can alter the way circuits are functioning um, in a way that um, may hold promise for shifting people away from habit-based actions toward goal-directed actions. That looks to us like one of the deficits um, that is present in people with a history of substance abuse. And we'd like to know, is it there in people with a family history as well um, as a pre-existing risk trait? I'm fascinated that you see the same percentages across species and humans, that mm -hmm. that 17% seems to be that magic number across. That, yeah. that's, that seems to be the, the, the real, that what, one in five or what, one in six or so. Right, and I think that this is one of the issues too that underlies the sort of um, ways in which we haven't been successful in medications development is that if only a small proportion of the rats are going to be punishment insensitive, that means most of the rats that are in our studies aren't really showing the phenotype that we're trying to get at. Um, so I think that's, that's one issue. Mm -hmm. I was curious, like um, programs for, um, um, like uh, the 12 step program mm -hmm. and, and people that go through those and uh, you know, the recidivism. So people, very small, are successful and mm -hmm. most people lapse. Right. Do the, if, if you took like a lot of those folks and looked at them, do you think the people that were successful would demonstrate any of those mechanisms? Has anybody looked at? No, I think that's a great question. Um, there has not been systematic study of what differentiates people who succeed in AA and those that don't. Um, clearly, I'm, I know people who AA saved their life. Yeah. It, it's no, there's no question in my mind. Um, why doesn't it work for everybody? We don't know. Well, why does it work? Why does it work for them? Right. Yeah. I think that's a million dollar question. Yeah. yeah. Um, we know, uh, you know, I take inspiration from the depression field. So um, there's a neurologist and psychiatrist named Helen Mayberg who pioneered um, brain imaging in um, depression studies where they did pet imaging of people immediately um, after they were put on to either a placebo or an SSRI drug. Um, I think it was Prozac. Um, and then they did PET imaging to see where activity in their brain changed as a consequence of taking that medication. Um, and they were able to predict from those immediate responses in the brain who would respond, who would get better. Um, and it didn't matter actually whether they were taking the active drug or the placebo. The ones who showed activity change in this one particular area of the brain, they were the ones who got better. Um, and that led her to pioneer the use of deep brain stimulation to that area in people with intractable depression. Because as it turns out, it doesn't matter if you have um, electroconvulsive therapy or talk therapy or drug therapy, any kind of therapy causes a change um, in the functioning of that particular brain area. And it turns out if nobody's, if, if a person is not responsive to any of those therapeutic interventions, you can just put an electrode in there and change the activity directly. Um, and I'm hoping we'll be able to find that sort of um, target um, for addiction um, as well eventually. But if we had that kind of data, what happens in the brain of people who respond to the whatever therapy they respond to, that may give us some good ideas. I think one of the reasons why, I mean, why people probably don't do better, it could be environmental. I mean, mm -hmm. if you, you know, if you hang around mm -hmm. people that are, are like that, you're gonna find, you know, you, when you continue to do that, you can find yourself relapsing because you're being so close to it and you continue being close to it, right. you're just like, okay, maybe I have to start doing that again. Right. You know, that might be an okay thing. I mean, it's the same way with, you know, all the way around as far as addiction, the same way with drugs. I mean, mm -hmm. you hang around people that do drugs, you don't find yourself doing it too. Right. Go ahead, Josh. Okay, um, 
As far as, like you were saying, the 12-step programs, mm -hmm. um, my grandpa was a chronic alcoholic mm -hmm. for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, he finally joined AA. Mm -hmm. um, AA saved his life for a while. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have sat through many an AA meeting, mm -hmm. and it seems like the people with the longest years of sobriety mm -hmm. have traded their alcohol addiction for cigarette addiction. You mm -hmm. have the smoking side, non-smoking side. Mm -hmm. Smoking side is five plus years of sobriety chain smoke one after the other. Mm -hmm. Relapse in non-smoking side have less year chips. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I think that has a little bit to do mm -hmm. with substituting alcohol abuse. That very well could be. Um, I know uh, other folks who um, they become very, very active exercisers. Um, and that may be, it's, um, for the most part, a really constructive uh, replacement. Is that increasing their endorphins? Yes. Mm -hmm. So is that the factor? That, that might be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another thing people often uh, use, uh, consume a lot of sweet things. So mm -hmm. another thing you'll notice at AA meetings is that there's always somebody who has to bring the cookies. Um, and uh, there's a lot of folks who, um, either former or current alcoholics who have a really sweet tooth compared to average. Um, <laughs> I've done some work with a fellow at UNC who is very interested actually in this sweet liking phenotype. If you give them different concentrations of sweetened water, um, you get up to a concentration that's like eight times more concentrated than Coca-Cola. Um, and there are a class of people who report that as, mm, they like that. That's, that's their favorite concentration. And the majority of people <laughs> do not like that. It's like drinking syrup or something like that. Um, and the, um, that sweet liking phenotype is more common in alcoholics and it's more common in people with a family history of alcoholism. And so sweet foods in cause endogenous opioid release also. Um, so it could be that there's a trade-off. Alcohol does as well. Uh, uh, there could be an exchange of those behaviors. Uh, I have another. Um, the sweets is true. Mm -hmm. My grandpa had the biggest sweet tooth. He had to have a huge slice of cake every night and drank sweet tea like it was going out of style. And it was so sweet it would crunch. <coughs> and then, <coughs> as David said, uh, people who relapse mostly are people who are around it or predisposed to an addiction before or after they quit. Um, I guess I don't entirely agree with that. <coughs> uh, my family has a chronic history of alcohol abuse. Um, my mother has a psychological dependence on marijuana. Mm -hmm. uh, my uncle is an alcoholic, had a crack addiction at one point. Um, from the time I was 16 to about 21, I had a habitual marijuana usage. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say I was addicted, but it got in such a habit of, hey, mom, smoking a joint, I think I'm going to have a puff. Mm -hmm. And I went out of town for a bit, come back, uh, didn't touch it. She constantly does it around me. I have no drive to do it. There's nothing making me want to do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. And then I guess I'd, have, I'd say another socioeconomic factors, mm -hmm. low income, middle class, Native American as well. Um, it all depends, I would say. There are, there are a ton of factors, right? There are a ton of environmental factors and biological factors. I agree with that. Um, one thing I think is really helpful is for people to be aware um, in their family um, of, uh, you know, if, if there's a big part of your family tree with substance abuse problems, you know that uh, you probably got dealt an unlucky set of genes. You may not. You might have gotten lucky and, and not gotten uh, very many risk genes. But I think awareness of that uh, helps, uh, helps you be mindful um, when you're using substances that you're, you're playing with fire in a way that other people may not be who are doing the same thing. The dominance model that you showed. Yeah. Back to his com uh, comment about socioeconomic. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and tend to see um, maybe drug abuse and you know, substance abuse more widespread mm -hmm. in, in folks that are in the lower socioeconomic or even their choice of drugs mm -hmm. differ between, mm -hmm. you know, so the Wall Street guy's doing cocaine mm -hmm. and the people in the street are smoking crack. I mm -hmm. mean, is that the dominance model in effect? I, I didn't quite, what can, what can, what can we draw from that? Um, I think that one thing we don't really understand is what is it about being the subordinate monkey that makes cocaine so much more reinforcing um, and my my guess is what we know from studies of social dominance in primates is that their stress levels are extremely high um, and that high levels of stress um, we know from other um, lines of research also make people prone to um, to abuse substances so um, I think it may be the case that conditions of extremely high stress um, and there's data suggesting that among alcoholics um, high levels of childhood adverse events whether that's you know having a parent um, die or go to jail or being abused all kinds of things that make childhood difficult um, for some people those also increase risk of alcoholism in adulthood sort of there's been some change to the way their stress response system works that makes them vulnerable. Um. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you.